In this video here, we're going to talk about some guidelines for graphing polynomial functions, and we'll actually do one or two examples, depending on how much time it takes, uh, of actually doing all this stuff and drawing the graphs of polynomials. So before we get into the, the guidelines here, if you haven't watched the other videos that I've done about polynomials, you should probably watch those before you watch this one, because um, in those other videos, I explain about the zeros and the multiplicities of the zeros and the end behavior and all that stuff. So if you haven't seen those videos and you don't know what these things refer to, then what we're about to do here may not make that much sense. Right, so I would encourage you to make sure you watch those other videos and then watch this one where we kind of tie it all together and summarize it and actually use it to, to draw the graph of a polynomial. All right, so first thing we, we want to do when we want to graph a polynomial function is find the zeros of the polynomial, right? So we factor the polynomial, if we can, in order to find those zeros, which remember, the zeros of the polynomial are the x-intercepts of the graph, right? And we also want to find the multiplicities of those zeros, because remember, the multiplicities tell us how the graph behaves as it goes through each x-intercept. Does it go straight through? Does it bounce off the x-intercept? Does it curve on the way through? All right, the multiplicities of the zeros tells us that information. All right, so very important thing when we want to factor or when we want to um, graph a polynomial is to find the zeros. That gives us the x-intercepts. Those are like some of the, the signposts on our graph, you know, some points that we know where they are, and also the multiplicities of how they behave. All right, then we want to find the end behavior of the graph. Right, do both sides go up? Do both sides go down? Is one side up and the other side down? Right, I went through a whole video where I explained the, the rules for end behavior. So again, check that out if you haven't seen it yet. Um, so we want to find the end behavior of the graph. Uh, test points, I put a question mark next to this one here. You don't always have to find test points. What test points are, are like after you find your x-intercepts, you pick numbers in between those x-intercepts to see is the graph above or below the x-axis, how high does it actually go? If you do everything else correctly, you don't need to worry about test points, right? Test points, if you're not real confident that you did the end behavior correctly or if you forget some of the rules for the multiplicities of the zeros, maybe you want to do some test points just to make sure everything's going in the right direction, right? But it, again, if you, if you know the, the steps one or two and, and you do those correctly, there's really no need to do test points. And then the last thing on here, graphing, um, you put it all together, you sketch the graph. Right? You, you make sure the graph has the correct end behavior, you make sure it hits the right x-intercepts, you make sure it behaves the correct way as it goes through each x-intercept, um, and it should all fit together to give you the right graph. Right? No part of this should contradict any other part. You know, if your zeros say that you know, at the end it goes downward, but your end behavior says that the end is supposed to go up, that means you made a mistake somewhere. Right? All of it has to fit together harmoniously to create the graph of the polynomial function. All right, so those are our basic guidelines. What I'm going to do now is pause the recording, erase this stuff, and then I am going to put up an example and we'll actually do these steps and, and draw the graph of a polynomial function. All right, we've got our polynomial function up here. f of x equals 5 sixths times x plus 1 squared times x minus 1 times x minus 4 to the third. All right, and we want to sketch the graph of that polynomial function using those guidelines that we just talked about. Okay, so the first guideline was to find the zeros. I almost forgot what it was, right? So the first thing we do is find the zeros, and the order that you do them doesn't really matter. So if you want to do the end behavior before you find the zeros, it, as long as you do them all before you draw the graph, it doesn't matter how you do each order or what order you do them, right? But to follow the list, um, we had the zeros first. So our polynomial is already in the factored form, so that's good for us. Now what we need to do is... Now, in order to find the zeros or the x-intercepts, we set our function equal to zero, right? So zero equals five six times x plus one squared times x minus one times x minus four to the third. And since this one's already in the factored form, now we can just go straight to setting each factor individually equal to zero. Whereas if this was not in the factored form, first we set it equal to zero and then we factor it and then we proceed with what we're about to do here. All right, so this one saves us the work of actually having to factor this, which is a nice thing because for one like this, most of the time when you see a polynomial like this, it'll be in the factored form. Um, generally, you, you aren't asked to factor polynomials that are like a fifth or sixth or seventh degree, uh, meaning you have an, like an x to the fifth, sixth, or seventh power. That's a little bit much, um, kind of a lot of work to do, to, to have to do that factoring and then do all this other stuff as well. So anyway, um, it's factored, it's equal to zero, so I set each factor equal to zero. Zero equals five, six. All right, the five, six out here is one of my factors, so I include that. I have zero equals x plus one squared. I have zero equals x minus one. And I have zero equals x minus four to the third power. All right, so 
Now I have to solve each of those for x. Well, the first one here, 0 equals 5, 6, that doesn't make any sense. Right? So don't make this. I've seen a lot of students make the mistake and say, well, I have a 5, 6 here, so then x equals 5, 6 is one of my solutions. It's not, right? It's not x equals 5, 6. It's 0 equals 5, 6, which obviously 0 and 5, 6 are not equal to each other. So this is just kind of, you know, discarded. Remember, when we're using, when we solve by factoring, we use what we call the zero product property, which says if we have a number of things multiplied together that equal zero, at least one of those things has to equal zero. It doesn't say all of those things have to equal zero. So it's okay that five, six does not equal zero. Since there's no x here, then that's just, we, we kind of like just ignore it. Or another way you can think about it is, back up on this step here, if we divide five, six to the other side of the equation, it disappears from the right side, and zero divided by five, six is still just gonna be zero. So that five, six, we can just ignore it. It just kind of goes away. All right now, if there was an x out in front here, we would have to pay attention to that. That would give us x equals zero, which would be one of our x-intercepts. Right, but if it's just a number, just ignore it. All right, zero equals x plus one squared. Well, I can forget the squared. Any, 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 if I'm raising something to a power and it equals zero, the only way that's going to work is if what's inside that parentheses equals zero. Right? The only number raised to a power that ever equals zero is zero itself. So I can think of this as just 0 equals x plus 1, and forget about that parentheses to the second power. Um, and then I subtract 1, and I get x equals negative 1. Right? Now, the multiplicity of this 0 is 2. Right? The exponent on that factor gives me my multiplicity. Right? So one of my x-intercepts is going to be x equals negative 1, and it's going to have a multiplicity of 2. And in a minute, when we, when we draw the graph, or in a few minutes when we draw the graph, um, we'll talk about what that multiplicity of 2 means. But remember that where that comes from is the exponent that I have on my factor, right? My factor of x plus 1 was there two times, so it has a multiplicity of 2, right? 0 equals x minus 1. Well, here if I add 1 to the other side, I get x equals 1. And since that x minus 1 factor was only there one time, right? That parentheses doesn't have an exponent, which basically means it has an exponent of 1. Then this means that this has a multiplicity of 1, right? That factor only showed up one single time, and so the multiplicity is 1. And then the last one I have, that x minus 4 to the third power. Once again, just like this one, I can ignore the third power. The only number raised to the third power that equals 0 is 0. So I can just solve 0 equals x minus 4, which I add 4 to the other side, and I get x equals 4, and that's going to have a multiplicity of 3. Right? Because that x minus 4 is being raised to the third power, that factor of x minus 4 is there three times, right? That's x minus 4 times x minus 4 times x minus 4 again, right? That factor actually shows up three times, so we say it has a multiplicity of 3. All right, so those are my zeros and my multiplicities, right? That's the first step or, uh, of those guidelines that we talked about a few minutes ago, right? So I have my zeros, I have my multiplicities, and yeah, when we actually draw the graph, we'll, we'll talk about what those multiplicities tell us about the behavior of the graph when it hits those x-intercepts. Mm -hmm. All right, the next thing we had on our list was the, uh, the end behavior. All right, so step number two, the end behavior. Um, let's talk about the end behavior. Now, if, again, if you didn't watch the video that I did on end behavior, you should check it out um, so that what I'm about to do here makes sense. But for the end behavior, we look at, if you recall, the, the leading term, right? The number times the x raised to the highest power and whether that number in front is positive or negative tells us one thing, and whether the exponent is an even or an odd number tells us something else, and we put those together to determine, well, does the graph both ends go up, or this end is up and this end is down? What's going on there? All right, so now the, the, the disadvantage of having the polynomial in the factored form is that we cannot clearly see what the leading coefficient is, right? The factored form makes it real easy to find the zeros and to do all that stuff, but it makes it a little bit harder to find the, the leading term and then the, the end behavior. So what we do to find the end behavior here or to figure out what our leading terms should look like, I think about just the stuff with the x's and the numbers in front. So I have the 5, 6 in front of all my parentheses. In this first parentheses here, I have that x plus 1 squared. Forget that plus 1. Let, let me just think of that as an x being squared. Right? In the next parentheses, I have an x raised to the first power, and in the last parentheses, I'm going to have an x raised to the third power. Right. So to kind of explain why I'm ignoring that, that plus 1, minus 1, minus 4 that's up there, think about if I do x plus 1 
squared, right? If I do a parentheses of x plus 1 times another parentheses of x plus 1, when I multiply all that out, I'm going to end up with an x squared and some other stuff, right? But if I'm looking for the leading term of my polynomial, that's the x that's raised to the highest power. So when I multiply all this stuff out, all I'm really concerned with is the x raised to the highest power. So if I take the x raised to the highest power from here, here, and here, and multiply all those highest powers together, that's going to give me the overall highest power in my entire polynomial. All right? So from this one, I'm going to end up with an x squared. And since there's a 1 in front of the x, it's just a 1x squared. If there was like a 2 here, it was like 2x plus 1, well then when I do 2x times 2x, that would make this a 4x squared, and I would include that 4 here. All right? So I'm looking at the coefficients of the x's, and then the powers on each x, right? This x, you know, x minus 1 is just an x to the first power. Um, and the x minus 4 squared, again, if I multiplied three of those x minus 4s together, the biggest exponent I'm going to get is an x to the third power. And when I multiply by, by these other x's, that's going to give me my biggest, uh, my biggest degree or my biggest exponent, right? So if I multiply all this out, I would have a 5, 6, x to the 2, 3, uh, 6 power. Right, remember, when you're multiplying bases with the same exponent, you add the exponent. So 2 plus 1 plus 3 gives us 6. So this is going to be my leading term. Right, to figure out the leading term, I do not actually have to multiply all this stuff out. That would take a long time and would be kind of a pain to do. I can just think of, well, I have a 5 6 times an x squared times an x to the first times an x to the third. That's going to give me a 5 6 x to the sixth power. All right, so that's my leading term. And now we have to analyze that to figure out what the end behavior is going to look like. All right, so first off, we have an even degree. Right? And another thing I should point out, the degree of your polynomial, if you add up all your multiplicities, 2 plus 1 plus 3, they also add up to your degree. So it's like a way you can double check to make sure you did things correctly. Um, but adding up all your multiplicities also gives you that degree of 6. All right, so an even degree tells me that both ends go in the same direction. Right? If it's an even degree, it beca behaves like a quadratic. Which were uh, for a quadratic, a parabola, either both ends go up or both ends go down. All right, so I know it's either both up or both down. Whether that leading coefficient is positive or negative tells me which way it goes. Since it's a positive leading coefficient, right, so I have a positive leading coefficient with an even degree, that tells me both ends go up, right? If I have a positive x squared, the parabola opens upwards. All right, so my end behavior in my graph is going to look like that, where both ends go up. Right? Even degree says they both go in the same direction. Positive leading coefficient, they're both going upwards. All right, now to write out the end behavior, remember there's a, a notation we use. As x approaches negative infinity, y is going to approach infinity. As we move off to the left, the graph goes up. As x approaches positive infinity, y approaches positive infinity. Right? X approaches infinity means as we move off to the right, the graph is going up, y is approaching positive infinity. All right, so there's my end behavior. Here's all my zeros with my multiplicities. Uh, what I'm going to have to do here is pause the recording real quick and erase some of this stuff so that we actually have enough room to, to sketch the graph now. All right, so let's put all this information together now to, to, to make the graph. All the stuff that we found from before I put up here, so my, my zeros, my multiplicities, my end behavior. Um, so now we just have to put it together to do the graph, right? So I'll start with my zeros. X equals negative 1. Sorry, so my x-intercept, one of them is going to be x equals negative 1. The other one is going to be x equals positive 1. And the other one is going to be at x equals 4. All right, so I start by just marking those points on the graph. Pretty easy to do. And then what I do is I start on the left side. I, I generally like to start drawing my graphs from the left and work off to the right. Um, and I start with my end behavior. I know that on the left side, my graph is going to be going upwards. So I start with the arrow pointing up here. All right, and now as I go towards my first x-intercept at negative 1, that had a multiplicity of 2. Right? So if you recall, a multiplicity of 2 means I bounce off that x-intercept. Right? Just like a quadratic function in x to the second power, you know, it has that same shape as that parabola when it hits that x-intercept. Right? So it's going to bounce off there, go up a bit, but then curve and come back down. And when it hits the x-intercept at x equals 1, it has a multiplicity of 1, which behaves like a linear function, meaning it goes straight through. Like an x to the first power is just a straight line. So when it hits that x-intercept at positive 1, it goes straight through like a line. And then it's going to go down here and curve again. And then at x equals 4, it has a multiplicity of 3. That behaves like a cubic function, which curves as it goes through. And that gives us our graph. Now, we don't know where the high and low points are. You need to learn some calculus to do that part.